Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Let's Talk Art program. And welcome to Kirk, Kirk Sharp, who is the director of the Gordon Parks Museum at Fort Scott Community College in Fort Scott. Welcome, everyone. Tonight's program is a conversation between me, Eileen Jun Wang, co curator of the exhibition Gordon Parks. Homeward to the Prairie I Come, and Kirk Sharp, who the director of the Gordon Parks Museum. Fort Scott, uh, well, Gordon Parks Museum is at Fort Scott Community College in Fort Scott, which is Gordon Parks' hometown. Before we get to the heart of the program, a reminder that closed captioning is available. You can click on the CC icon, which should show up either at the bottom of your screen or at the top right corner. This program is being recorded and the recording will be available on the museum's YouTube channel at a later date, probably in a week. A transcript will be available with the recording. For the benefit of audience members who are primarily listening to this program, I will offer brief descriptions of what we are seeing on screen. So I'll start by describing myself first. I'm a woman of Chinese descent with medium length, dark brown, straight hair, and I am wearing a white sleeveless top. Kirk, would you please describe yourself in one sentence? Oh, Kirk, you're, you're muted. Sorry about that. I'm an African-American male. Um, I'm sitting down and I'm wearing a gray polo type shirt. And you have a portrait of Gordon Parks behind you. Yes, yes, I do. A very Actually, great one, a cool one. Yes, very cool one. <laughs> so before we begin tonight's conversation, I want to acknowledge that K-State, as the first land-grant institution established under the 1862 Morrill Act, is historically home to many Native nations, including the Kaw, Osage, and Pawnee. Furthermore, Kansas is the current home to four federally recognized native nations, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska. Many native nations utilize the Western Plains of Kansas as their hunting grounds, and others such as the Delaware were moved through this region during Indian removal efforts to make way for white settlers. K-State and every university in the United States is on indigenous land. The recognition that America's history begins and continues through indigenous contexts is essential to this museum, which seeks to create decolonized spaces at the university and increase the presence, promotion, and support of indigenous and other traditionally marginalized faculty, staff, and students at K-State. All right, Kirk, I will go with my first question for you. Let's start with the basic. Um, what's the origin of the Gordon Parks Museum in Fort Scott? Well, we started back in 2004 uh, with the steering committee to first establish to honor Gordon's uh, legacy, his remarkable life story. And then we started to create a celebration and that in turn into create a center, a center for culture and diversity and to help with that story. We started in a small, very small office uh, across from where we're at right now and in the library area. And it just kind of blossomed and grew each year. Um, this is where they started with the celebration in 2004 and this year is our 18th, uh, 17th and 18th annual celebration. So we're excited about that. And then we were able to get a grant through the Kreskigi grant and build part, uh, build our, build the fine arts center. And we got part of the museum as part of that fine arts center for that grant. And so we're here in this spacious uh, 4,000 square foot facility in our area. So um, the, here at the museum, uh, we dedicate to honor internationally known photographer, filmmaker, writer, musician, Gordon Parks, and to tell his life story and to help teach other about artistic creativity and cultural awareness and cultural diversity that's in all of our lives. And I think, isn't it when the, 
when the museum was first established, it had a different name? Yes, it did. It was established, um, at that time, it was the roots uh, of it all. It was the steering committee, and, it's, and uh, the name was the Gordon Parks Cultural Diversity Center, or Gordon Parks Center at that time. Gordon Park Center for Cultural Diversity? Correct. And then we later changed our name to the museum once we got more established. Because we did, when we had a small room, you have to think about, we, there was a ground roots project with the steering committee. So it just started basically in a small office and it just kind of grew and, and grew and we just got able to get more established. When did you change the name to Gordon Parks Museum? About four years ago, three or four years ago, three or four years ago. And then I know that um, Gordon Parks donated photographs to yes, the center, did. right? So when it was first established, he was- Yes, he did. After Gordon was here for our first celebration, it was a wonderful time. And uh, we use his autobiography book, A Choice of Weapons. And we use that coin of phrase to give a Choice of Weapons award to the honoree. Mm -hmm. And so Gordon was our first one in 2004. And Gordon had just a wonderful time here. He was just so impressed with everything we, we did here uh, for the celebration and honor his name. Um, he immediately wanted to donate uh, about 30 of his iconic gallery photos. Uh, we have on display. And then also um, his family members throughout the time donated more uh, of uh, belongings and uh, personal items and uh, photos too as well. So as a point of reference for our audience, I just want to point out that as far as I've been able to do with my research, I believe that the earliest group of photographs that the Gordon Parks, that Gordon Parks gave to a public institution was to Kansas State University. And that was, he pledged it in 1970, started working on it in 1972. And the group was given to K-State in 1973. And um, from my research, I believe he gave four groups of photographs to public institutions through in his lifetime. And um, after K-State, he gave a group to the Corcoran Gallery of Art, which is in Washington, DC. And now it's actually in the National Gallery of Art, that collection. And then the third group was to the Gordon Parks Museum. Yes, in and then- 2004, is that right? He did, he did that in 2004, but earlier than that, before the steering committee was established in 2002, uh, we had a dedication to the hospital here in Fort Scott, Mercy Hospital at that time. and. Gordon befriended uh, Mayor Ken Lunt at that time. He's very uh, critical into that uh, connection with Gordon coming back to Fort Scott. And Gordon then, he donated approximately uh, 70 items, um, photos, poems uh, to the hospital, to the Mercy Foundation Hospital at that time. And they had that on display at the hospital prior to our steering committee was established. So we, in essence, we had two different locations where people could come and, and view the Gordon Parks Museum. But with the closing of the recent closing of the last probably three years ago um, of the hospital, uh, the foundation, the Mercy Foundation Board graciously donated those photos and, belong, and, and the rest of the collections to the Gordon Parks Museum here in Fort Scott to us. Yeah, I, Kirk, yes. Thank you for reminding me of that. So in fact, um, earlier than the donation to the Gordon Parks Museum was the donation to Mercy Hospital. Um, yes. And, and th that group was transferred to the Gordon Parks Museum in 2018, correct? Uh, 2019, actually. At uh, 2019. Yes. So um, the Mercy Hospital group has 70 photographs, you said, and then the Gordon Parks Museum got 30 photographs, right? Correct. And what I want to point out as really unusual is that the Mercy Hospital group of photographs included poetry, as you have yes. pointed out, Kirk. So he, he kind of envisioned a different kind of display where it was photographs interspersed with his poetry. And he chose which poems that would yes. go with the photographs. And, and he did that in dedication of his mother and father. Oh, he Andrew did. Sarah Jacks, yes in honor of Sarah and Andrew Jackson Parks. I learned something new from you every day, Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> you. Awesome. I learned something new about uh, Gordon every single day. So 
I know. Right. <laughs> Tony Clark. I feel like he's my teacher who's teaching yeah. these things. <laughs> yeah, something, I come across something new every single day. Yeah. And if you don't learn, you don't grow. So. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, um, you were talking about objects that were donated to the Gordon Parks Museum, some from Gordon, from Mr. Parks, and then some from his children later, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, what are some of the objects in the collection that you consider interesting? Can you show us some of those and uh, talk to us about it? Yes, um, if you have some of those for this to show. The, the one of the interesting topics that I really intrigued with was this combination with his uh, desk and his lamp and the National Medal of Arts he received in 1988. I don't know if pulling up that, can pull that up, but it's a, it's a, the desktop that he worked on, worked uh, his books on. He wrote his books on uh, starting with the choice of weapons. So oh, all wow. books after a choice of weapons um, is he written on this desk. And it's so authentic. It's, it's just so creative that you can see the, the wine glasses stains and the <laughs> coffee mug stains on it. I love it because that's reality. That's working. That's um, living at the desk. And, and then there, we have a picture there. You can, you can see that the, the picture with the, uh, of him receiving the award from President Reagan in 1988. Um, and then, or the medal, I should say. And then we do have the actual, this is the actual National Marts, a National Medal of Arts medal that he received in 1988, uh, along with the photo of Gordon in the background and that the lamp, the corner lamp uh, also is Gordon's lamp that uh, he had uh, along with that and everything else into his apartment. So that, I think this is one of my inspiring sections um, because to me, it shows a lot. It shows um, the hard work that it takes that he chose to work on a, this type of desk. He probably could have got a newer type of desk, but he stayed with that at that time. Even then, it was probably older. He purchased this in around 1960, uh, 1965, uh, before he even moved into the Plaza uh, apartments. And the, the lamp itself is pretty much a day lamp that shows you he just he just stuck to roots, uh, the true roots of it. And the metal, it just tells you the achievements that he's made and the, all the obstacles that he had to overcome in his lifetime. It, it's incredible. It's, it's a wonderful mm -hmm. story to, about persevering that a lot of uh, folks that still, of any age needs to still learn, but especially for the younger generation to learn. Um, so this national, it's the National Medal. The National of Medal Honor. of Arts. A Medal of Arts. So yeah. it's in a wooden box, it's and, yeah. and it, the medal is a bro is bronze. Is that right? Yes, it's a bronze type gold medal in a wooden maroon box with the vel maroon velvet uh, to the side. What about that photo be behind the box? That's Gordon. Parks. Yeah, that's Gordon sitting uh, either at that table that we're looking at or another table similar to that in his apartment. And I'll and just point out that he has a baseball cap on backwards. Which backwards. I, I've seen him, there's some photos of him where he does that from time to time. Yeah, I've, I, that really surprises me because <laughs> he usually is like very, you know, much more uh, dapper and kind of formal in wear than that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> And um, what's the next object that you want to show us? The next object is, it's, th this is very unique and we're ve I'm very excited about this object. We just recently obtained this object uh, just a few months ago. And this is the actual cornerstone from the AME church that Gordon's family attended along with Gordon. And it's the same AME church that Gordon used in the filming of the learning tree. Uh, I, I was just on cloud nine that when we came across this and I'm still excited now every time I look at it. Um, it's the oldest African-American church in the community in Fort Scott and from established in 1886. And we were just very fortunate to have this find. And we have this now in the museum. So we're gonna work on trying to preserve this, even this um, tombstone even further. 
it's so the, it's the church it's an building incredible. is no longer existing the church uh yes and church uh, unfortunately um it, the membership was a high of course being the the first one the most populated one but membership just eventually dwindled throughout the years and in the late 80s it really dropped and especially into the 90s it just didn't really have any membership so an outside um church or organization or owner took over control of the church and just the church has been was just neglected for many many years and we tried to reach out uh, at that time the city tried to reach out a lot of people around our community try to reach out to the owners of the church to try to work with them because the church was so bad a shape it was deteriorating it was considered a safety hazard the bricks were starting to fall down on the fireplace on the walking paths of the sidewalk and it was just in really bad shape but there was a moment in time where there's something that could have been done to, to revive it but the owners just at that time just wasn't willing to work with the city and um, several people from the community reached out to try to obtain the church because we really want to keep the church. Actually, the goal was to create the museum or the, 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 the Gordon Park Center inside the church to keep that church in existence. But unfortunately, um, we tried and tried and tried and they, they ended up having to condemn the church and it was uh, demolished around uh, uh, the early 2000s or late 1990s, I believe. I think it was around the early 2000s. So unfortunately, the the lot uh, is still there and you can kind of see the indentions of the foundation, but the church is gone. But we do have pictures uh, of the church and revived. And um, it, it's, it's incredible that we're able to uh, have this uh, great find here in the museum to, to keep this type of history alive. So it's like a cornerstone because there's a, inscription on it, AME Church erected November. Yes, it's a cornerstone. November 1st, 1886. Yes, by Pastor B. Uh, T. B. J. E. Merritt. Walton, or, or T.J. Mar. I'm sorry, yes. Yes, T.J. Merritt, pastor. And then there's B.F. Watson, is that right? Yes, and I'm not sure what that, um, the second initials are after that. Okay. Um, I know you have two more, so I'd like to move on to make sure we cover those. Okay. The next uh, one. And this is not so much in the an object in the museum, but this is part of our Learning Tree film, uh, uh, film Sign Trail project that we've been working on for the past year, which is complete. We're going to have a grand opening event during our Gordon Park celebration. Uh, which is October 7th through the 9th next week. The grand opening event is actually our kicking off the celebration. It's in conjunction uh, with the uh, Chamber Coffee here in Fort Scott. It's going to be at eight o'clock. And the, 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 the tree sign location trail is basically a series of signs to where the to it's going to be installed in the places where the filming took place. Uh, in 1968, the Learn Tree. The Learn Tree is the first time a black uh, filmmaker made a major motion picture movie in Hollywood. And it was through Warner Brothers. So this is a Warner Brothers production. So you can imagine the buzz around the community this, during that time in 1968 would be about the same type of buzz it'd be today in 2021. It was incredible. So a lot of people in the community were extras in the film, uh, either worked with a cast or crew, and a few of them even had speaking parts. A lot of this film holds a lot of fond memories for the folks here in Kansas uh, and Fort Scott and across Kansas, and it's very near and dear to folks' hearts around it here and across the nation too as well. It's a powerful film. Uh, it's a semi autobiography about Gordon's life growing up in Fort Scott, and he's the based off the novel that he wrote in 1963 with the same title. So here you're looking at probably I would think probably my favorite sign. Um, just because of the, the colors and really because of the photos that we of images we never seen before that was um, created by some of the great photographers at the time that that donated it, the, the images to us. So if you're looking at the upper right corner where it see the pond or lake and you see a shelter house, that's the exact same shelter house that was used in the scene, the picnic scene where you can see them shooting the fireworks over the top of that. And over to the left corner, you can see some more of the behind the scenes with Gordon. It's kind of hard to see in this little screen, but Gordon's overlooking the lake 
um, the production crews, trucks are there. And on the middle of the sign, you can see the, this is one of the angles we've never seen before. Uh, looking north um, from a south direction, you're looking north and you can see the pond and the colors of the balloons, the picnic, the people voting. Um, it, it's incredible and they filmed all that. And actually Gordon's um, walking around with the megaphone along with the other system director and just kind of shouting out the orders how things are coming or what he'd like to see. So each sign is uh, at 36 inches by 24. It's a very large sign. It's an inter uh, interpretive sign at an angle and each sign has a QR code. So folks can go and learn more information about that scene or anything else part of the learning tree. It's a driving tour. So we make a, a tourism trail with that. So people can just follow all the different locations. And we also have a virtual tour, tour uh, with that too as well. So people at home can go to the website and look at some of the scene locations and find out some more interesting facts about the, the film that took place. So you, next, when, you say, when you say website, is it the Gordon Parks Museum website or there's correct. a learning tree? The, Gord, the Gordon Parks Museum website, we have a section on our website. Wonderful. And I see like on the bottom right hand corner of the sign, it tells you what's the next destination with the address for yeah. it, so you and know how to drive to there. Uh, because they did the filming, not in the filming that you would see order. They, matter of fact, I think they filmed parts of the, the ending scene at the, at the beginning. And so they kind of jumped around uh, in doing that. So if someone was to go in the same sequence, they'd be going back and forth all over the place. So we uh, purposely put on there just a next location sign. So folks can kind of see where the next location sign that depending on where they start, because there's no starting point that you have to start reference to, but it depends on which uh, area of the film that's or location that you may be interested in. And so this scene is another powerful scene. It's uh, the funeral scene. And he did this at St. Mary's Church in Fort Scott Catholic, I'm sorry, St. Mary's Catholic Cemetery. And uh, it's just outside the city limits of Fort Scott. And in the, uh, the middle picture to the left, you can see some of the two tombstones. So Gordon um, put um, movie props tombstones inside mm -hmm. there and you, this one I think if you zoom in it probably either say Captain Tuck or Booker Savage on one of those mm -hmm. and so it, and then another one we have a wonderful picture of different angles uh, the one on the far right the smaller one that's more in color that's an angle we've never seen before and if if you can see it on the bigger sign it's kind of hard to see it here on the screen um, you can see the actors and they're actually filming the scene but the group of people probably about 15 to 20 different group of people are just people, audience members, just people, just community members, just watching the filming taking place. So it was an open set. And so it's incredible. That's it's unheard of nowadays where everything's so hush hush. And so again, it's just a great opportunity for people to get a good perspective of the places that Gordon actually was at and where the filming took place and the scenery that, that they use and what the, the kind of things that he was looking at. This is really wonderful addition to Fort Scott because last time I last year when I went to visit for research, all these signs were not up yet, but I got the very nice personal tour from you, but now people can do the tour on their own. Oh yes, it, it, it's great. Uh, we had a we had a wonderful planning committee that worked very hard on this. We all worked together. It's this is something we've been uh, dreaming about doing not just last year, but for many years in the past. And we was just able to pick up the momentum. We got support with it, great support from our current landowners of the, each of the sign locations and the city support, county support, um, even Lane County, because they use the courthouse uh, in Lane County, Mount City uh, Courthouse. So they were very supportive of it too. So everyone across the board has been tremendous with this and people in the community. So we're, we're very excited and we can't wait to get this uh, grand opening event uh, kicked off next week. And those behind the scenes photographs, are they were they photographs taken by people who were in the production crew or Fort Scott residents? Well, a lot of them was in Fort Scott residents, um, Fort Scott residents, and some uh, just photographers um, that just was on the 
on the set during the filming. So it's a very, it's kind of a, a wide variety of the, the collections that we have. So they're wonderful candid photos. It's, it's great. It's um, some of the photos we have is just very uh, unique. It's just gives you the, a great perspective of what actually takes place behind the filming. And you can see them uh, um, rehearsing their lines or relaxing or smiling or it, it, it gives a great perspective to the film. I think you have a group, a, a quite a big group of photographs um, in the Gordon Parks Museum that's from one of the Fort Scott residents who was working on set. Isn't yes, it? actually it was J.K. Graham is, has a majority of the behind the scene collections that we have. J.K. Graham uh, was a lifelong friend of Gordon. He was a childhood friend of Gordon and actually at one time lived across the street from Gordon growing up. And so uh, he befriended them for a very long time. And uh, I think Gord, uh, JK kind of, kind of considered himself as the go get it man, the go do it person. He was Gordon's kind of a right hand man uh, to look at different locations, go get uh, a cowboy hat or go get a red shirt because Gordon wanted a certain actor at the scene to wear a certain red type of shirt. And he sent uh, JK to go get that type of shirt. So. And JK had a lot of access to the scenes and he just took some great act, real photos of the actual film. It, it, it's incredible yeah. the, the, the access that not just JK had, but everybody else had uh, during that film, filming process. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say too that I noticed some of the photographs came from uh, K-State Special Collections too. Yeah, yes, Norman Tannis. And also he also donated uh, photos to Pittsburgh State University. So he had a connection to both Pittsburgh State and Kansas State. Yeah, well, um, can you tell us more about the highlights of this year's Gordon Park celebration? Yes, uh, again, we're excited about this. This is the 17th and 18th annual celebration. Unfortunately, we wasn't able, able to have it last year due to the pandemic. That's why we're combining the two. And this year, the, this year is a special year, as always, but um, this year we're honoring Kyle Johnson, who portrayed Gordon's character, Newt, in the film The Learning Tree. And also we're honoring Eli Reed, a acclaimed photographer and author, uh, who's also uh, a former instructor at the University of Texas and also did a lot of still photography photos and films such as Ghost of Mississippi, Beautiful Mind, Rosewood, and Poetic Justice and a host of others. And also Kyle has also started his career in the family show business because he started at seven years old because some folks may remember uh, know, remember the name of his mother, Nichelle Nichols. Uh, his mother was also a uh, Choice of Weapons honoree a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And then also she also portrayed uh, Lieutenant Uhura on the original Star Trek series. Oh, okay. And so uh, Kyle grew up in show business and he did some things with daytime TV and uh, such as uh, General Hospital and My Squad. And, and so we're, we're excited to have uh, both uh, Eli and uh, Kyle here to receive the award, uh, the Choice of Weapons Award. And then also some other things well, along with the grand opening event, we're gonna have a lunch and learn uh, presentation with uh, Professor, uh, John Edgar Tidwell, and also local historian Arnold Schofield here in Fort Scott. It's going to be Gordon Parks, Fort Scott, and the Learning Tree Revisited. So we're going to talk about the Back to Fort Scott um, assignment that Gordon was on, and then also talk about the Learning Tree and the comparisons and contrast from the book to the that, that adaptation to the film. And then also we're going to have a film showing of the Learning Tree. Well, Kyle's going to do the introduction to that too as well. And then we're going to have a, a presentation um, by Doug Barrett with the All Things Kansas. And then, of course, introduce yourself. You're going oh, to yes. <laughs> I'm giving a short presentation on <laughs> <laughs> the Gordon Parks Homeward to the Prairie ICOM exhibition. Yes, yes. Here at that combination. And then also we're going to have a conversation uh, piece with uh, both the, uh, of the honorees. Um, and then we're going to have... Uh, uh, Professor Michael Cheers from San Jose State University is going to do a launch event and a press, uh, press event on his project that we're really excited about called I Needed Paris. It's going to take uh, 
student uh, photography students to Paris to follow Gordon's footsteps when he went to Paris to take uh, photos of fashion models. But this time we're gonna use more diversity um, with this. And then also he's, they're gonna use the same type of camera that Gordon used wow. uh, during that time. So it, it's incredible. And they're also going to do a documentary and visit what's known as Little Africa in Paris and do a documentary on that, take photos. And he's gonna to look to create a book. And, and I think they're gonna to try to create this project and get the proceeds to the Gordon Parks Museum. Uh, we're, we're excited. We're, we're hoping everybody can come out to that event as well. And then we're gonna have uh, Angela Bates with the Nicodemus Historical Society is gonna come and do a presentation on children of the promised land um, from the post uh, civil war to the Western Kansas, the all black community with, that still exists to this day. And then also we're gonna have Eli Reed's gonna do a short presentation of some of his body of work. And then we're gonna to go to the local, uh, another local museum, the Little Milken Center here in Fort Scott, where Unsung Heroes is gonna do an exhibit on African-American suffragists. And one of the, uh, the exhibits gonna be Langston Hughes' mother is gonna be revealing of that too with, uh, uh, with Mamie Diller too as well. And then we're gonna have a performance uh, music performance with Dominique Hammonds. He's a contemporary jazz and R&B violinist. He is incredibly, incredibly talented violinist. Um, he was classically trained at the young age of eight. He can play anything from classical, country, pop, hip hop, R&B. He even does his own recording, has wonderful songs. He's coming out. He's getting ready to put three albums out, from my understanding, and then possibly a Christmas album. So it's it's one of those performances. I, I tell everybody you won't want to miss it. We had him here about three months ago for a fundraiser event to a packed house, and the dance floor was packed the whole time. And people kept on saying, I can't believe I'm out, I'm out here dancing and jamming to a, a violinist. I mean, he's incredible, incredible, multi-talented uh, young man. And then we're gonna have um, a tribute to Shaft. This year is the 50th anniversary of the film Shaft. And we're going to have uh, Kevin Wilmot, um, uh, filmmaker, um, just recently won Oscar a year ago too with Spike Lee for film Black Klansman, also Professor KU, is going to host a conversation piece with David Parks, Gordon Parks' son, on the filming of the Shaft and, and the impact of that film and how it changed movie making. And then also, we're gonna have a panel discussion. It's gonna be narrated by uh, John Mason, Professor John Mason. Um, it's gonna be of the three things that uh, Gordon disliked about America, racism, poverty, and discrimination. And then also I'm remiss, um, go back a little bit. John, Professor John Mason is gonna do another presentation on Friday. Uh, it's a book club presentation on a choice of weapons book that we're doing in collaboration with the Fort Scott Community College Library community read series of their cultural diversity uh, series. And then we're gonna have a uh, photographer and historian Don Thompson from Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's gonna talk about the reflections of the commemoration and the celebration of the Tulsa massacre um, in this past uh, few months ago in 2021. He's gonna talk about some of the key events that uh, were significant during the celebration of that and the commemoration of that. So, and then we're gonna have a showing a shaft and we're gonna have a tribute dinner and uh, present the, excuse me, <coughs> present the awards to the to the honorees. So it's a full fun packed three days. I know, that's right. And so um, anyone who's curious, you can just go to the Gordon Parks Museum website and you will see the program with the schedule of all the activities on the website um, if you're interested in going. And I hope uh, some of you can make it there. Um, I should, now um, turn the platform over to questions from our audience. Um, I wanna make sure that we keep to our time. Do we have any questions from the audience right now? Jen, can, can you help me? Cause I don't think I'm seeing anything in the chat or did somebody want to raise a hand and speak? Well, as people are thinking about that, um, I did have one burning question, so I will jump in with my burning question, Kirk. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we were talking about uh, Gordon Parks filming The Learning Tree in Fort Scott, and that was a, a big homecoming, you know, in 1968, and he 
hired so many Fort Scott residents to help with the production. So it's almost like the whole town was involved in the filming of it. And Kirk, your mother, right, was part of that too, because your sister was a extra. In yeah, the actor, four of my sisters were. And because uh, they, they said, well, they think they got on the cutting floor the newer <laughs> version of it, because uh, they, they're not in there. Their section part of is out of it, but yes, oh. they were. My mother uh, did do uh, behind the scenes with the old 16 millimeter reel, and um, she uh, recorded part of the carnival scene, part of the scenes that were at the National Historic Site, at, at, that's considered National Historic Site now at the time. And um, so it's kind of, it's, it, you can see where my sisters are talking with Kyle, having a conversation with them, kind of clowning around along with Carol Graham too as well, and, and some of my cousins too as well. So unfortunately I wasn't in that film when she did it, but uh, it's very fun and exciting when we pull that video out and, and watch that. <laughs> right. Um, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, so Kirk, you know, before 1968, did Gordon Parks, what was Gordon Parks' um, kind of connections with Kansas? Because he came back to Fort Scott in 1950 to do that life assignment, Fort Scott Revisited, which, uh, which didn't get published, but, you know, he had done this whole, uh, you know, photo essay, including writing the text for it. But between 1950 and 1968, did he have any um, contact? Was it infrequent until 1968? What do you well, know about I'm that? I'm sure he had a lot of contact with uh, family and friends because his sister, um, Anna Brown, still lived in Fort Scott at the time and uh, and a brother-in-law, of course. And so I'm sure he had a lot of phone contact, a lot of letter contacts. And of course, he came back in 1950 to, to when he was on assignment for Life magazine and that didn't get published. And uh, that's what brought us to back to Fort Scott project. And then he came back in 1963 to do some photographs and promotion of the book, The Learning Tree, where mm -hmm. he took the one of the famous photos that a lot of people like is a boy with June bug. And that uh, young boy was uh, Clyde, Clyde Adams. I yeah, and I, he did a whole group of photographs that got published in Life, which was kind of a visual staging of uh, the learning tree before he started making exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, our museum director, Linda, is asking both of us, but I, I'll see to you, Kirk, why is Gordon Parks an important figure for young people today to learn about? It's kind of like what I mentioned before. He's he's came from poverty he he's came from growing up with with segregation deep segre segregation with challenges and obstacles that only we can even think about but he actually had to overcome them um he never had an easy road to anything but he would still persevere he still kept moving he still kept challenged himself to do better and he talks about how Gordon talks about how he doesn't like to do frivolous things. He wants to do something that's meaningful and purposeful. And I think the younger generation could really learn a lot about Gordon's life and the powerful uh, statement that the things that he's done, the, 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 the career impact that he's done. And you have to remember that he did all the things he self-taught. He taught himself how to take photographs. He taught himself how to be a filmmaker. He taught himself how to play a piano at a very young age on an upright piano in his home. And he's done two concertos. He did a symphony. symphony. He's, he's uh, done a ballet, directed a ballet uh, about Martin Luther King called Martin. Um, he wrote the soundtrack to the learning tree, all without knowing how to read music. Um, and he never could read music. He'd make tick marks and stuff. Um, his arrangements for the learning tree and a lot of his music is is incredible that he can do those those type of things. Then he makes arrangements for diff, different instruments and the, just the things that he's done. It's, it just shows the type of uh, energy and persevere that all students, no matter all people, can really learn from. I, I'm in awe every day when I hear some of the things that he's done and achieved. And he never had a chance to graduate high school, um, and he never had a chance to attend college. And he's received over 50 honorary doctorate degrees. 
it, it, it's a, it's very powerful. Of course, um, during that time during segregation, uh, of course, with Gordon and all other black students, they were discouraged from going to uh, uh, further their education to college, especially from a particular teacher and counselor here at that time. Uh, in school when he attended high school here, but when he received his 30th honorary doctorate degree, he dedicated to that teacher and counselor that told him don't go to college. When he received his 40th one from Princeton University, he wished that teacher and counselor was there because he'd just give her the award. And his, his, he just has a remarkable life story that everyone can learn from and really appreciate. And so I think that's one of the things that he's so important uh, figure not just for Kansas, but for the world. And that's why he's internationally known and loved all over because he means so much to so many people. Thank you, Kirk. Um, there's a quick question about where to access the Learning Tree DVD. I know it's streaming on Netflix. I'm guessing you can rent it on Netflix too. Kirk, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I'm having, to be honest with you, I think I'm having a hard time trying to find them too because I think they're, they're going through a remastering of the film. Uh, Criterion Collection is remastering, so I'm not sure if that DVD is available. So you might be able to stream it. I can see where you could probably stream it. Uh, I think on Netflix possibly, mm -hmm. yeah. um, like you mentioned, and some other uh, outlets. Uh, but the DVD is, I think it's going, it's, it's, I know it's going through a remastering right now and mm -hmm. through the Criterion Collection is working hard to get that released. And uh, it's, I've seen a couple of clips of that. And it's, it's incredible. So, yeah. And uh, somebody asked about the Gordon Park celebration um, programs. Are some of them going to be live streamed? No, they're, unfortunately, no, they're going to be, they're going to be live in person. Okay. Um, I don't think, I think I got all the questions and I'll just say that I have to wrap up. Um, so if you have uh, questions that didn't get answered, please feel free to email me. Um, my email I put in the chat box. So um, email me and I will follow up with an answer. Um, many thanks to our behind the scenes events coordinator, Jennifer Harlan and our captioner for helping us with this program. And Jennifer, did you, I believe you wanted to present some things to the audience before we wrap up? So Jennifer is uh, showing our next event related to um, the Gordon Parks exhibition. And this will be uh, a brief talk and a conversation between me and uh, Professor Deborah Willis, who is the chair of the Department of Photo Photography and Imaging at New York University Tisch School of the Arts. She's a renowned um, scholar of Gordon Parks and actually was one of the co-curators of Gordon Parks' um, first major retrospective, which was at the Corcoran Gallery of Art in 1997. So we are very honored to have her on our program and um, that we'll be able to talk to her. So I will say um, a formal goodbye to everyone. This will be the end of um, our the formal portion of our program. Um, Kirk, if you don't mind, maybe we could stay another five minutes just to see if sure. um, we can, uh, anybody with an urgent question. So um, everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And um, you are welcome to log off, um, and, but we'll just hang around for a couple of minutes um, in case somebody has an urgent question. Thank you and good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So Jen, if there's anybody who wants to ask a question, can we unmute or it's actually not possible for anyone? Eileen, we did get an additional question in the Q&A, it looks like, from a person that joined the program late. Oh, um, how large is the museum collection of Gordon Parks materials? Um, I hope the person who asked this question is still here. Um, we have 128 photographs that were donated 
by Gordon Parks to K-State in 1973. And then Gordon Parks came to Manhattan, Kansas for an artist residency in 1984 and another artist residency in 1985. And the photographs that he created, we have about 80 of those are also in the Gordon, uh, are also here at the Beach Museum of Art permanent collection. Um, it was um, residencies that were funded by the Man Manhattan Mercury and also uh, the Manhattan Arts Council. And the Manhattan Arts Center inherited those photographs. And a few years ago, um, the Manhattan Arts Center worked with the Beach Museum of Art to transfer those photographs to the Beach Museum of Art permanent collection. So we have over 200 Gordon Parks photographs. Eileen, our director, Linda Duke, has also raised her hand to pose a question. Okay. Hi, I would love to hear either one of you comment additionally about the idea of using the arts as a weapon to make our society better, to make it more just and compassionate. That was one of the most inspiring topics that Gordon Parks wrote about, I think, and um, one that I think is extremely important for us today. Kurt? Yeah, um, of course, Gordon, when he picked up a camera at a pawn shop, he used that to fight against the three things he disliked in America, racism, poverty, and discrimination. And that was his weapon of choice. And so we still need to use those type of weapons to, to fight against those things, unfortunately, because it still exists. And the arts is a wonderful way to do that through writing, through imagery, to media, through video, to express themselves and to be creative. And um, it, it's still needed to this day. And I, and so I know I've been asked before, the, what would Gordon Parks think about all of this rest and everything? I think just simply what he did before during that time in the 60s, he, he was the champion of social justice and he used that format to fight against those things, to express what other people couldn't express for themselves. And I think this, more and more, the arts just seems to get neglected, and it needs to turn back the other other way because it's it, it bring helps bring back humanity back to us a little bit uh, much more than than so than because without it, you see, you have to have the arts as it's a perfect balance and uh, and humanity. And I'll I'll say that for me, I think um, what I learned through studying what Gordon Parks did is that telling stories is the most powerful way to affect social good and to affect the change that you want. Um, you know, Gordon Parks in his work, you know, he wasn't preaching because you're never effective if you just tell people they should do this or should do that. But what Gordon Parks did was through his creativity, you know, through images and writing, tell stories of people so that, you know, maybe for a moment when we encounter his works that we can put ourselves in their shoes. And, you know, some of his photographs are so powerful, like for example, you know, the crying African-American little girl who, you know, was part of this very poor family in Harlem. Um, when you face that image, you can't deny, yes. you know, the difficulties that, such a family goes through and you know it it you can't help it you question why that is the case and right. that is the power of Gordon Parks's art and art in general you know is um to be able to tell powerful stories like that yeah just like that when he went to Alabama to do the segregation project um taking the images of uh local Dairy Queens with the colored only drinking fountains, fountains and signs. That's powerful. That shows you racism exists, bigotry exists, discrimination exists. And that brought that to the, open up the eyes of America to see that and the world to see that too as well. And, and he, he just does a wonderful job doing that with his photos of telling the story that just some maybe can't be told for themselves. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that's something that um, Gordon Parks did that is continuing to inspire us and inspire 
contemporary artists now, the next generation, um, like you know Doug Barrett, whose exhibition yes. is the partner exhibition to the Gordon Parks uh, Homework to the Prairie I Come, and you know he's telling stories of African American communities yes. now, and yes. and not just African American communities, but you know other marginalized people such yes. as veterans, war yes, veterans, the homeless veterans, and that's a perfect example. Homeless. Yeah, because he's speaking, he's, his photographs are speaking for those veterans that can't speak for them to, to yes. get their message across. So he's doing a wonderful job with that, just like Gordon mm -hmm. did with his stuff. Yes. And, you know, it's the power of the images for telling those stories. So, you know, Doug, just like Mr. Parks, you know, doesn't tell you what to do. He just tells you what is out there. You know, exactly. because maybe when you're walking down the street, you don't notice that person who's sitting in a corner holding a cup asking for change. Exactly. But, but Doug's work, you know, will make you confront that. Mm -hmm. What you do with it after, that's up to you. Um, do we have another question? So, no, it doesn't look like it. Okay. I think it is time to let everybody go. <laughs> this has been so wonderful, Kurt. Wonder, wonderful conversation. And I look forward to um, being in Fort Scott for the celebration next Oh, week. I'm excited for you all to come down and, and uh, we'll have a great time and enjoy the time. And yes, we're excited. Yes. All right. So I think um, we are, we can officially sign off. Okay. All right. Talk to you later, Kirk. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much, Jennifer, you, Jennifer. And, uh, and anybody else is out there. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.